Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Word for Word reading series event featuring our Penman Review Fall Fiction winners. This year's winner, uh, this year's contest had nearly 700 submissions, of which five winners were selected. And I'd like to point out that they were selected by popular vote. Um, we're excited to have the authors here tonight to read their pieces and celebrate SNHU's literary magazine, The Penman Review, which is now in its 12th year. My name is Paul Whitcover, and I'm the Associate Dean of the Online MFA. I'm here with my colleague, Jacob Powers, the Associate Dean of the BA and MA Creative Writing Programs. Um, I mentioned already that uh, we're recording tonight. Um, I believe I have disabled people's cameras and mics. If that's not the case and you find you do have camera and mic access, please don't exercise it. Uh, we want to keep the spotlight focused on our readers. Um, We'll uh, have all the readers come on and uh, read their stories, and then we'll have a Q&A session after that. Um, the chat in the team space will remain open, and uh, we hope that you will uh, feel free to use it. Um, you can post questions there, and Jacob and I will surface them um, to the, to the uh, readers later in the event. Uh, but you're also perfectly free to um, leave comments there as you're listening to the readings. So uh, with that said, I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to my colleague, Jacob, and he will introduce our first reader of the night. We're going to be going in reverse order from fifth place to first place, but every story you hear tonight is a winner in more ways than one. I assure you of that. That's right, and thank you so much, Paul, um, and welcome everyone. It's always great to have everyone here and to celebrate the Penman Review. Uh, you know, I'd like to first introduce our, our first reader. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see her in the room quite yet. So what we're going to actually do is that I will um, read the bio and then Paul has uh, graciously accepted uh, the task of reading the story for everyone to enjoy as well. And if um, she does show up, then we can go from there. So I'd like to introduce the first reader's uh, story for the night, Mackenzie Bodily. Uh, she's gonna, she writes as M.W. Bodily. Uh, the short story is called Rat-a-Tat. While M.W. Bodily uh, has been writing for a few years, she didn't start sharing her work publicly until recently. She thought that the fall fiction contest would be a great place to start. When writing Rat-a-Tat, she was thinking of childhood fears that can come from a vivid imagination like ghosts or monsters. Ratatat was a science fiction interpretation of my childhood fears, she says. Specifically, I wanted to focus on how the fear of imaginary monsters, physical or mental, can hold us back and impact our lives. As she's nearing the end of her BA in creative writing in English, Mackenzie says she would love to expand her career into literature and turn writing into a full-time job. I'm excited to continue my writing journey and know that I and my classmates have great futures ahead of us, she says. So thank you so much, Mackenzie, for submitting your work and congratulations on placing fifth. We're sorry that you cannot be here right now, but I hope it's OK that Paul read your story so that everyone can enjoy it. I am very happy to do that. Um, I hear I have I've received an email, Jacob, by the way, that another one of our winners is in the um, is in the lobby, although I don't see anybody in the lobby. So uh, I just I just accepted her. So it looks like okay. we're good there. OK, cool. Um, so uh, as Jacob said, I have the privilege of reading uh, this wonderful story um, from uh, Mackenzie Bodily, Ratatat. Marlyle watched the words beacon active slide over the walls of his one man cruiser. The cabin was dark, illuminated only by the stars outside the window and those words projected in bright red by his ship's distress beacon. The beacon rotated and the projected words moved over the dark interior at a rate of 30 seconds per rotation, twice a minute, 120 times an hour for three days. He had timed it. A lone man would go crazy alone in space. If the reports of space sickness were true, some did. Trapped with no lights or sound, the human mind rebelled. Marlyle wasn't going to let that be him. The key was keeping itself busy. The first day, he classified the stars the ship passed. Red Dwarf, Blue Giant, Protostar. It worked for a while, but several hours into the exercise, the stars all started to look the same. 
he was going in circles. The second day, he calculated how long he could last without aid. He had enough rations for 16 days tucked in the supply closet. He lugged a box into the main cabin, jumbling against the steel shelves as he went. Oxygen would run out before he starved. The thought of suffocation was unpleasant. Late on the third day, however, a tapping came from somewhere in the ship. He stood in the center of the main cabin, every sense alert, every muscle tense. His heart was pounding. He forced himself to listen. The noise was coming from the supply closet. The door stood ajar, and every 30 seconds, the red letters jumped through the gap and illuminated a two-inch slot of steel shelves and silver ration packets. The sound was just an illusion, he thought to himself. It was his mind playing tricks on him. It was nothing to worry about. He was alone on the ship. He was certain of that. At least, he was almost certain. He backed away from the door and came to a space opposite the opening. Two silver machines stood side by side. He slid into the gap between them and sank to the floor. The supply closet door stood across from him, open. There was nothing there, he told himself. Nothing in the supply closet. This was all in his head. The human mind was used to endless stimulation. Put that in a dark void, in a room without movement, without sound, and it would start hearing things. Space sickness was humanity's own evolution turning against it. If he looked inside, there would be nothing there, nothing but shelves and supplies. He would look. Tomorrow, he would look. On the fourth day, the door had moved, or at least he swore it had. He watched the red letters spill into the gap and tried to remember if two had fit inside at a time or three. He started counting without realizing it. Twice a minute, the letters disappeared into the gap and his heart started to pound. He ate his dinner without leaving his hiding place. It had been two days since he last ventured into the supply closet. He had no more food or water outside of it. He had to go inside. He would go insane otherwise or starve. He took a deep breath. The tapping continued. He reminded himself of everything he'd read about space sickness. He imagined himself getting to his feet, sliding out of the gap, crossing the room, and opening the door to the supply closet. He even imagined looking inside the small space and seeing what he knew had to be there, rations, shelves, and nothing else. But the sound continued, and he could not go inside. Hours passed, and the small clock, kept alive by emergency power, changed as the sixth day began. Marlyle was thirsty, hungry, and hadn't slept for 36 hours. There were things at the edge of his vision now, little wisps of movement. He had to go or starve. He stretched his cramped legs and, with an arm pressed against the wall of the ship, got to his feet. The tapping was constant. He watched the letters of the beacon slide into the doorway three letters falling into the gap before leaping out and continuing their journey. He closed his eyes and focused on his breath. It was all in his mind. It was just a nothingness getting to him. It was space sickness. He took a step forward. There was nothing else on this ship. Nothing could enter it while in the vacuum of space, unless he froze. What if something had snuck aboard while he was docked? What if there really was something inside? And what if, by opening the door, he, he stopped himself. Go down that path and he would just create more monsters. Feed the sickness and it would grow. He had to face it. He had to face it now. He took another step. The distress beacon washed over him and cast a deformed shadow on the wall. He took another step. He was there now, his hand on the door. He opened it and the black interior gaped at him. He could make out the shelves, the silver packets, and the bottles. Faces swam before him. Their eyes were empty, their mouths open. They made his skin crawl. Marlyle steadied himself. The faces weren't there, not really. He looked closer. The room was empty, just as he knew it would be, just as the still sane part of himself knew it would be. The letters came round again, illuminating the closet. And then something, something that was not an illusion, moved. He froze, a scream gurgled and died in his throat. Unable to look and see what hung to his right at eye level, he stood lifeless, his blood draining from him and his heart pounding. He thought he could feel something perched there, something dark, something watching him. 
30 seconds passed and the letters spilled over them again. The light broke the spell. Marlyle leaped from the room. He scrambled on the padded floor and flung himself into his corner, his heart pounding, tears running from his eyes and his fingers digging his chest as if trying to stop his own heart. He pressed his back to the wall and sobbed. The door hung open now. He shoved his body deeper into the nook between the machines and sank to the floor, never to leave again. A supply craft picked up the distress beacon six days later. A party boarded the ship and repaired the hardware failure. The only passenger had died of starvation three days before. He was wedged into a corner, his eyes wide with terror, his entire body focused on the door to the supply room where 15 days of rations sat untouched. In the whole ship, only one thing moved. In the supply closet, hanging by a thread, was a cheap plastic mirror. It hung at eye level, and as the ship's oxygen pumped through the closet, it collided with the corner of a foil ration and made a faint rat-a-tat. Excellent a great work. story. Yes, <laughs> what a good twist, if you will, at the end and stuff as well. And just, I mean, it felt, you know, there's a lot of times where twists are like, eh, you know, but this one especially just felt so authentic and, and real and just great. So um, we're sorry that you couldn't make it tonight, MW, but thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, we hope you, we wish you the very best in everything and um, just keep on writing because you have a, a great career ahead of you if, if you uh, keep it up and stuff. So <laughs> thank you. Um, Absolutely. So our next, yes. Um, so our next reader, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump into our next reader and stuff. And then um, from there, so yes, um, our next reader is Ness Wheeler. And Paul, I think you're going to actually introduce. Um, I, I am. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm, great. I've got a lot of camera time. All right. <laughs> All right. Our next reader is Ness Wheeler, who will be reading her story, Beasts. Uh, Ness is a SNHU student studying English and creative writing. She lives in rural Virginia, which is my home state, and works as a librarian and in the realm of literary agents. Beginning with crayon sprawl stories about pirate queens and elves inspired by The Hobbit, she has always been a storyteller. Now her writing focuses on nature, connection, and how religion impacts the human experience. She ex expected to graduate from Southern New Hampshire University in winter 2025. Welcome, Ness. And you can come on uh, camera. Hi there. Very happy to have you read for us tonight. And without further ado, I'm just gonna turn it over to you. All righty. The long winter had forced every creature to be bold in how they got their nourishment, and few were as bold as I had been to keep my brood fed. At midnight, every ten sunsets, I gathered my murder and brought them to a small clearing in the depths of the wood. Then the humans would come, and they would leave one of their own behind, unmoving in the grass. Crows always took care of their dead. When I stumbled upon a corpse of my own kind, I cast strangled cries to heaven to alert my murder. My companions swarmed to stand vigil with the body, singing morning songs and guarding it against greedy-eyed foxes and vultures. We covered them with leaves and branches. It did not matter if we knew the deceased, if they came from far and wide, or if they slept a few branches over. We grieved, protected, and sang all the same. The humans left the people they brought where they fell. They would drag the victim from their home or a cage and bring them from the cluster of human nests into the woods. The executioners in dark mantles did their work swiftly and abandoned the butcher to be stripped of its flesh by creatures like me. By the time they returned with their, last, with their next prisoner, the birds and the wolves had left the sliver of forest free of the remnants of the last. I sat atop the branch of a tall ash tree, close enough to claim the corpse before any other beast could, but far enough away that none of the humans would consider catching me for an easy meal. My murder waited deeper in the woods for my call to descend. 
Among them were my mate and our children, silent and anxious. Even with these ventures, the cold had ravaged us to bones and feathers. My feet shifted on the bark. They came when the nearly set sun had dyed the snowy ground purple and blue, after most humans were fortifying the fires in their homes to fight against the chill of nightfall. Two men in clothes the color of midnight strode into the clearing. Between them, they dragged a man with a hood tied around his head and a wooden sign hanging from his neck. His mostly bare body was young, and he was much smaller than the two men at his sides. Red patterned scars stretched across his calves and forearms, like all the victims brought into the woods. I leaned forward to see better. Above, the evening stars turned away from the scene. The woods were silent, as if even the spirits of the trees dreaded what was to come. They kept his hood on as they forced him to kneel and positioned his neck atop a boulder. I was grateful. It was necessary to eat, and so we would but it was much easier when we did not have to take a good look at who it was. Our work was necessary, but not always enjoyable. That was why we limited ourselves to feasting on those unwanted by their own kind. Vain and conceited doves who always ate from the hands of men would even call that grossly vile. They had much to say when I poked my head into the houses of the people that owned them, but none of them had felt the wind in their feathers nor did they have a mandate from the great mother bird herself as crows did. It was our duty to cleanse the world of rot that would otherwise spoil it. A great duty at that. Humans left as much to clean. Other creatures abandoned scraps of prey they could not finish or intentionally left their dead behind after they found there was nothing else that could be done for them. These creatures, however, did not seem to kill due to a need to feed irredeemable things. One of the men glanced up at me from his post besides, beside tonight's victim. He had a ring on his thumb, which glittered more than the snow beneath the coverings on his feet. Our eyes met momentarily. Curiosity shone in his blue eyes. I poised myself, ready to call off the patrol around us. A meal was not worth losing our own to be roasted or boiled, no matter how deliciously facile it could be. The man turned away from us to mutter something to his comrade in the vulgar human tongue. This second fellow raised a brow, but said nothing in response as he took his blade from his belt. He held the hilt up high and passed it to his companion. I, I admired how the moon rippled over its surface. It was the type of material I would love to tuck into my nest, though the man's stick was far too large for me to carry off. Many men carried such things. They used them to hurt each other in disgusting displays of brutality. My mother had told me that crows sometimes fought over the edges of territory and carnage, but in all of my seasons of living, I had never seen such a thing. The only other crow, the, the only other murder of crows I knew of lived on the other side of the forest, and I had seen enough foxes sleek around trees with black feathers in their mouths to know that they had enough troubles that their territory would not be worth a fight. A low moan came from beneath the hood, one so soft I almost mistook it for the wind. He started to babble. I did not know why the men came to kill each other in this part of the forest. So I could not fathom that for what she was begging. Freedom or forgiveness or something to cover his bare blue toes with. The man with the ring moved quickly. His steel came down in a flash of gray and sliced through the prisoner's nape. I looked away but the sound I was waiting for never came. When I looked back, the kneeling man was still mostly whole. The blade had not been sharp enough. Heads had a habit of wanting to stay attached to the shoulders they rested on. The man with the ring raised the glimmering steel again and brought it down upon the prisoner's neck with a mighty swing, flop. Heavy smells permeated the air. I heard wings rustle from behind me. My son, I guessed. He was always the first to dive in. The men both exhaled and they murmured a solemn vow. They cleaned their steel with a rag and set off on the road that had brought them there. The man with the ring cast me a final look. His furry face screwed up and wrinkled before vanishing beyond the rolling hills of trees. I waited a few long moments until the sound of their feet crunching frost was long gone. And then I rose on my haunches and opened my beak to give my call. 
A woman burst through the thick of the forest, cracking twigs and pushing past bare branches with reckless speed. Her gray hair was wild and her brown skin was scratched from the thorns she had run past. She fell to her knees beside the prisoner's body, cradling it in her arms like an infant. Screams ripped through her throat until it sounded raw and hoarse. They echoed through the bleakness of night like the cries of wolves. Tears trickled down her cheeks, frozen before they could fall to the snow. I could only watch. Surprise shuddered through my feathers and my heart pounded with hurt. None of our other victims had people to cry over them. Hers was unlike any songs we crows sang, nor was it like any other ritual I had seen of any of the beasts of the woods practice. Still, I understood. Come, let us return to our hunt, I said to my murder, cawing into the trees. With a great flap of my wings, I took to the sky. In the distance, the members of my murder fluttered up from their hiding places to dance among the clouds. They would understand when I gave them my explanation. We would return another day, for tonight there were better meals to find, ones who did not have mourners. Thank you so much, Ness, for reading that. Uh, just wonderful, uh, beautiful language throughout, and I loved the personification of, of the, the crows, um, especially when you know the crows, were, uh, this narrator, the crow, uh, the mother crow, was talking about how you know. Um, they, they differed from the doves who ate from the hands of men and would call them grossly vile. Um, and I, I thought you did an excellent job reading it aloud, too, because it just felt you could feel this just casualness in, in what the crow sees. Like this is just a another 10 days for her uh, to witness this. Um, are you a big uh, ornithologist or bird fan or? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And crows are pretty special. You know, they have they really are. high intelligence, so they're fun to study and think about. Yeah, I've heard a lot of interesting things about crows before. I remember once hearing that they will, they know traffic pattern lights. And so they'll know yeah. when to like fly down and put something in the road to have it crack open and stuff and, and, and be able to get it out of the way. And they're always the bravest of birds. Whenever you see them eating on the side of the road, it's like, well, they're not going to move for me. It's like, they know, they know you're not going to hit them. Because yeah. who's going to hit a crow? That seems like pretty bad luck. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Ness. This was wonderful. Thank and you. thank you for reading to uh, reading for us. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next reader now. Um, Re, I'm not sure if you want to see if you can hop on camera while I'm doing this um, or while I'm introducing you and stuff, um, just to make sure you have camera access and mic access. And if Hi not, there. we can. OK, I can hear you. <laughs> can I see you, though? Not quite yet. Um, how about I start introducing you and then, Paul, if you want to see if there's a way to um, uh, make sure that her camera is visible or that she's visible on screen. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to introduce you. So our third reader for the evening is Ree Bunch. Um, Ree Bunch has been writing as a hobby for a long time. And in 2015, uh, she decided to turn her passion into a career. After receiving positive feedback from instructor Dr. Lisa Wood in her MFA program, she decided to submit Sleeping Beauty to Snooze Fall Fiction Contest. And Sleeping Beauty was inspired by the feeling of unexpected loss, uh, as well as Grimm's fa fairy tales. Bunch also took inspiration from the story of George Carl Tanzler and Elena Helen Milagro de Hoyos. Bunch has self-published three books so far, Phobias, The Biblo Promised Land, and Next of Kin. And in her free time, she enjoys painting and carving linoleum prints, and she hopes to pursue opportunities that allow her to turn her writing and art into a full-time business. So welcome, Ree. Um, I still can't see you, but I can hear you. So if you'd like to go ahead and start reading um, your piece, that would be wonderful. All right, sounds good. Sleeping Beauty. I'm dying, she croaked. The sing-song in her voice was strangled out in a hoarse wheeze. It's the flu. The back of my hand rested on her forehead. Her hair was matted to her skin with an oily sweat. She felt hot, but I'm not sure of what a high fever feels like. She was the one who took care of me when I was sick. You'll survive. You're going to look so stupid if I wake up dead. Her coughing was getting worse. She was gasping between each ragged bark. She gags before hacking out crimson phlegm into a crumpled, into a crumpled tissue. You're being dramatic. You'll feel better in the morning, promise. My lips sizzled, kissing her forehead. I love you. 
I love you more. She grumbles, propping herself upright before dozing off. Nothing felt the same in the morning or the day after that and the day after that. She just laid there, cold, pale blue. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know. I didn't want to make the call. I didn't even know who to call. Calling anyone, saying what had happened to another person would cement this horrible dream into reality. The light of my life, the crazy, chaotic, burning light had gone out without me even noticing. We were both frozen in that irreversible eternity. I sat on the bed, holding her hand in silence the first day, half hoping she was playing with me, that if I rubbed her back or squeezed her hand hard enough, she would wake up. She'd wake up with that mischievous smirk saying, made you worry, what's for breakfast? For eight days, life went on, dusting the furniture. I have web meetings with my boss about whatever, grocery shopping, folding laundry, and the dishes. Nothing was real or important, like all the pieces of my life were now unattached from what, from what was holding it together. Every day, she looked more rested, a peaceful sleep, not the kind of grisly, slack-jawed expression of horror of a body in a ditch or the waxy sheen of grandparents in caskets. The kind of sleep, like when you come home in the middle of the day to find your lover sleeping in bed. She was soft, relaxed, with a dull ashen pallor. She was sleeping beauty, but even lo true love can't reverse death. I left her bed as it was. I tidy up the tissues and making the bed around her, spraying the room with spring renewal for breeze, the kind she liked best. I sat with her talking about the days while gently holding her cold hand. This new loneliness was insufferable but it was becoming something I could carry with me. I was afraid. I was afraid for her being alone. I was afraid to be alone myself, afraid that one day I would come in here and she would be dust, afraid that someone would peek through the bedroom window to see her there. On the ninth day, it was a Sunday because it was a new 90 day fiance. And the first I watched without her, something fell down in the hall. It was heavy, landing with a hard thud that shook the picture frames on the walls. Rose on the couch, a new wave of terror hit me. I had accepted being alone, never really considering something could be in here with me. The hairs on my arms stood on end as shuffled steps echoed down the dark hallway. My vision blurred. My head felt impossibly light and unattached from my body, unable to fully comprehend what I was seeing emerging into the living room. A sweet odor of wet leaves churned my stomach. She was standing in the living room, her thin arms gripping the doorframe for support. Her long chocolate brown hair was a wild bird's nest of knots. It was still here. The pale shaking love of my life somehow returned. My thoughts were like gnats, a cloud of them all buzzy and flying into each other, unable to do anything or go anywhere. Her jaw clicked as she opened it. A rough growl exploded from her throat, sending a dagger of fear into my heart. This isn't possible. This can't be real. You promised you wouldn't watch it without me. She stomped her foot, crossing her arms. She pursed her lips at me. I don't know why we watch shows together when you always watch ahead. All the frozen time of the past day sped up and collapsed in on itself. The blood stopped traveling in my veins and my heart refused to beat as I watched her amble towards me. She dropped onto the couch into her favorite spot, reclining onto her favorite throw pillow, the blue one with the long silver tassels. Started from the beginning, she half sang in the way she always had. She threw her icy feet into my lap and I jumped up. How, how, how are you feeling? I said, my cheek chattered as I backed away. Hungry, really tired. Like when you sleep too much, how tired you feel? I feel cold, so I think my fever finally broke. Are you feeling sick? I breathe deeply, trying to steady myself. Her hazel eyes are a bit dull, but she smiles like she always does. The crick and mischievous one that I can't stop myself from smiling back. I wring my hands before raking them against my scalp. I'm going crazy. What's wrong? You look awful. Did I get you sick? No, honey. As long as you're feeling better, everything is fine. Sit down, start the show. Better yet, play last week's. I can't seem to remember anything from the past few days. Yes, honey. Grabbing a throw blanket, I sat back. I sat down beside her. She grabs her pillow and nestles beside me like any ordinary night. She feels so much lighter than before, but her head is a block of ice in my lap. She, she cocoons herself into the black fleece as I play the episode she asked for. My fingers gently working out the knots in her hair. She smiles. I love you, she said. I love you more. Thank you, Ree, for, for that incredible 
story. I'm sorry uh, the camera situation isn't working out, but that was a beautiful reading. Thank um, you. I, I love this story. I love so much about this story. Um, it's hard to even know where to begin. But I think what I love the most about it is like how it engages what we think we know and yet turns on a dime to surprise us in, in ways that we never could have expected. And it does that a few times throughout the story. You think you know where it's going. Oh, no, nope, no, it's not going there. Oh, now I know where it's going. Nope, you don't. I think that's so great. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. Did you, did, were you kind of, uh, what, what was your emotion as you were, as you were writing the story? Because it's, so it's like a sad, it's a sad story in, in many, many ways, but it's also a fun story. So I guess when I was sitting down to write it, I kind of had this idea that I've been playing with for a while about somebody, and I guess we we're kind of drawing from like putting myself in the position like, like, cause my husband was sick around that time. And I'm like, okay, so if my husband passed away, what am I going to do? And I'm like, I guess just sit there and be real sad my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> but then I just started like going a little bit further with those ideas and with those feelings and then just kind of like twisting it and, um, kind of incorporating some of that true crime element of uh, the Tansler story that I was drawing a little bit of inspiration from. That's, that's awesome. Well, we'll come back and talk some more about this. I, I, I love that it was inspired by your husband. It's like, honey, I, I, I want you to know that you inspired my latest story. Really? Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Just, <laughs> you might want not want to read it right away. All right. right. So, um, so we're going to move on to our next reader. And uh, our fourth reader of the night Gabe Converse will be reading his winning story, Dark Water. Although Gabe has been writing for seven years, he grew serious about it more recently. He's written six books and some screenplays, and he's now submitting his writing to enhance his portfolio. He hopes to find a literary agent to help him publish his most recent manuscripts. Dark Water stemmed from an idea Converse had about a couple struggling to move past grief. He heard about Snooze Fall Fiction Contest at the last minute, and finished his story shortly before the deadline. Converse is currently in his first year of SNU's Bachelor's in Creative Writing and English program, and this was his first time submitting to the annual contest. Wow, you could win four more times, Gabe. I entered for two reasons, he says, because I love to write and I wanted to pu push myself to do something out of my comfort zone. Besides writing, he also enjo enjoys uh, drawing, excuse me, reading and watching horror movies. Welcome, Gabe, and take it away. Hi, awesome. Um, I've never read anything out loud before <laughs> except to myself, so apologies in advance. <laughs> um, okay. The pond behind the old house is full of leaves and scummy water. It haven't been touched for months. Lewis comes to it sometimes in the early morning, his feet bare and damp and plastered with mud, until Emma finds him and steers him inside. I'm going to have it taken out, she mutters, not to him. I'll call someone next week. I don't think we should, he tells her. She doesn't listen. They've had a strained relationship ever since the seasons changed. Lewis isn't sure why. He wakes up early and makes coffee for Emma, tidies the house while she's asleep. He folds a knit blanket across the couch, a gift from Emma's sister, and finds it in the trash the next day. She never mentions it. He can't tell if he's the problem or her sister. Sometimes she asks him how his day went, if he's ready to go back to work, maybe look, at, look for new clients. He's an artist by trade and he paints voraciously, but lately they've all come out looking like the woods behind the house. Mirrors a brilliant orange and red and yellow, painted by dark trunks, a starless sky. A few times he painted the pond, but the rocks around the edges had teeth and Emma told him bluntly that she hated it. He still hasn't forgiven her for that. No new clients, he tells her, with the implication to drop it. Then he feels guilty and adds, maybe I'll contact the gallery. I'd like to do a themed show. This satisfies her and she doesn't ask again. Every night, Lewis dreams of water, stale and bitter, filling his mouth and throat, dragging him down. In his dreams, he's frightened but excited, a strange relief, and he doesn't remember why. Sometimes Emma is there, her cry the distant and useless distortion, his name a plea on her tongue. Her fingers grasp his wrist but never drag him up. When the water chains him onto death, he wakes up gasping. Emma wakes up too, and she wraps her arms around him, soothing his panic away, though he never asks and never wants it. Mostly, he wants to be alone. October rolls into November and the leaves on the ground start to outnumber the leaves on the trees. The forest becomes a graveyard, the branches grasping fruitlessly at the stars. 
Emma grows clingy and distant all at once, snappish when he asks a question and cold when he ignores her. Lewis pulls into his own memories with a quiet, analytical desperation, running through a patchy network of impressions and conversations. He can't remember when his brain turns to fog and it troubles him. Let's go to your parents' house for Thanksgiving, he tells Emma two weeks before the date. We haven't seen them in a while, have we? Emma stiffens. They're sitting at their little kitchen table, he with the book he's not reading, she with her phone. The window behind her looks onto the backyard, the pond, the empty forest, the thick, rotting carpet of leaves. He's behind on the yard work. A moment passes before Emma answers. They're in Boston. It's too far on late notice. Maybe they could fly in. He shouldn't push it, but he only ever talks to Emma lately. It's just your mom and dad, anyway. They'd love to visit, and we could plan a big meal, maybe even just some... I don't want to. She stands with surprising venom. And you barely know how to cook. I can't do it all by myself, Lewis. I didn't mean that. But she's gone with the screech of her chair, leaving Lewis with only the large window in its quiet, dying view. A still pond and a cold wind he can feel from the crack in the back door. The yard is a derelict mess, but he can't remember abandoning it. Lewis watches a few leaves flutter to the ground, then stands to find Emma and apologize. He doesn't find Emma. She's not in their room, nor the bathroom, and they both avoid the second room out of habit. He checks the garage and finds his recent paintings and supplies. Emma isn't there either, either, but she's clearly gone through with things, and this annoys him more than he expects. It's not as if she hasn't seen all of his paintings, and she used to love them. Only recently has she soured on his art. The pond looms in his mind, another painting playing on his mind, but he doesn't move for his supplies yet. Instead, he flips through his recent works, studying the pond, the forest, the diffused yard, the pond again. A loop, it feels like, but each work is a little different, a splash of artistic liberty and seasonal spookiness. A hand reaching out of the pond, eyes like two stars between the black trunks of the trees. A stroke of red paint in the grass. He shoves his supply aside and lays the paintings out side by side, searching for something you have no name for, but all he finds are pieces, nothing useful, nothing whole. This angers him more than he expects. He kicks at his paintings, tearing one and crumpling another, and doesn't feel bad. They feel useless, these paintings, tepid outpourings of emotion he can't name, doesn't remember feeling, and if they're destroyed, they don't matter. None of it matters. He wants an answer, not absolution. Another painting tears. One flutters against an old cabinet he's been meaning to pick up, and Lewis glances at it, then pauses. There's something beneath the cabinet, a strip of white he'd never noticed. He gets down on his hands and knees, pulls it out with a hurried sort of desperation, and finds not one painting, but several. They are his works, his style, and they all show the same thing. Emma, himself, and a baby girl he has no memory of. Behind them, the pond sits in perfect condition. Emma finds him ankle deep in the pond, no shoes, only socks. The pond surface is thick with algae and other bits of scum, but he knows now what it holds. The bottom is a grave, in memory if not body. When Emma comes up beside him, he's, she's trembling. Anger and fear, perhaps grief. Sometimes they exist together. I told you not to go in here, she says, and I keep telling you, and you keep doing it. I know, he says. Then he adds, I was watching her, wasn't I, when it happened. She stiffens but doesn't say a word. There are none to give. He knows now, even if he only has pieces. She knows that he knows, and the whole between them have a name. The water, black and fathomless, draws him in. He doesn't realize he's leaning over it until Emma pulls him back with a hand on his chest. Stop, she tells him. Please stop. You can't do this again. I... Her voice breaks. She looks away. I told you not to come here after that, she says, but you keep you kept doing it every damn night. I thought you were sleepwalking, and you never stopped. He's crying openly now. For the first time in months, he wants to comfort her. He can't. The hole between them has a name, but it remains unfixed, a jagged opening with the stillness of dark, beckoning water. What happened, he asks. He needs to know if he's dead. She looks in with red, swollen eyes. I don't know. I pulled you out, and I thought you were dead. You weren't breathing. You were blue, and, and then you came back, I think. But you keep coming to the stamp thing, and I want it gone, okay? I want it gone, and I want you back, and I, I don't know why you came back, and she didn't. I hate you. I hate you. He looks at her, at her tear-stained face and the grief-like shattered glass behind her eyes, and wishes he could take it away, but only knows one method, and it's not what she wants. She seems to sense this, because she takes his hand and tugs him back. I don't want it, Lou. You go in, but I won't, all right? I won't. But he stares at those rocks, that filthy beckoning water, and wants it more than anything. Then he pulls back. It's haunted, he says. Bullshit, she says. It's a pond. He glances at her, then, then at the end, Kemp's yard, wishing he had the wherewithal to do something about it. It might be time. It might be too early. He can't tell. Let's go inside, he says. Her relief breaks over him like cold water. He allows her to take him into the kitchen, into a warmth he doesn't feel, and thinks about calling a yard service. Then he thinks, maybe tomorrow.
thank you so much for reading that for us, Gabe. Um, I just when uh, I just feel so much grief from it. I and and I and this character seems to be just suffering so greatly from this loss. This baby girl he has no memory of that. It's almost like not even allowing himself to be able to um, remember this life that he had before. And I love that line, the hole between them has a name. Beautiful work. And um, I also just wanted to say, I, I, you, you just do an excellent job of like capturing a scene and so, so concisely, but like having there be so much breath to it as well. The The paragraph that I'm thinking of specifically is when, he asks um, to go to the parents' house for Thanksgiving, and it says Emma stiffens. They're sitting at their little kitchen table, he with a book he's not reading, she with her phone. The window behind her looks into the backyard, the pond, the empty forest, the thick rotting carpet of leaves. He's behind on the yard work. Just says so much in so few words. It's just yeah. absolutely beautiful. Um, you say you're a big horror fan and stuff. Were you inspired by any specific... Uh, writers um, or film or anything when you were I, I love a lot of horror but I was actually um if you guys know Hozier he does um a lot of very spooky um like he's a musician for those you don't know but I assume a lot of people know him but um he does a lot of really spooky atmospheric work and there was a a song that he wrote I I have to, I'd have to check which one but it talks about I think it's like you know, wanting to go into the woods or like, you know, like as a couple almost like if, you know, it's about grief and that kind of stuff. And that really inspired me. Um, and I have memory problems. So <laughs> I just write that. Well, in well, it's it's beautiful. It all came together really well. So thank you so much for sharing it. Um, we'll have you back in just a, a few after we have our final reader here, uh, who I'll introduce now. Um, and that's Taylor Castro's. Um, so we've had a wonderful night so far, and I'd like to finish the, with Taylor's uh, piece. She's going to be reading uh, her, her her first place story, the wonderfully titled I Found a Genie in a Bottle of Glenn Livet 12 Year. Uh, Taylor lives in Clio, Michigan, which is my home state. I think Paul had a home state earlier. <laughs> she graduated from Central Michigan University with an MA in English Literature and Creative Writing. Her fiction and poetry have previously appeared in Daily Drunk Mag, Hot Metal Bridge, the Roadrunner Review, Milk Candy Review, The Harpoon Review, and Cease Cows, all of which are amazing titles for literary journals, if I say so myself. <laughs> she was a Pushcart Prize and Best Small Fictions nominee in 2020, and one day she hopes to publish a collection of flash fiction and share her love of writing with her daughter. So welcome, Taylor, and thank you so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. I found a genie and a bottle of Glenlivet 12 year. She told me my credit score only pre-qualified me for a wish and a half. Why are wishes dependent on my credit score? What isn't dependent on your credit score? I was sweating in the cold. She pulled a cigarette up to her lips, her free hand at its tip. She snapped her fingers and it was lit. How do I make half a wish? The embers of her cigarette lit up the small space between us and the liquor store parking lot. You ask for something you sort of want. She was nonchalant, blowing smoke in my face. You get one and a half wishes, that's all. I eyed her and the bottle of scotch at her feet. She was standing firm-footed, staring back at me. With a shiver, she zipped her jacket up to her chin and clapped both hands. Well, I can't wait all night. I stood there trying to think of something I only partially wanted. I want uh, a dog. I could be happy with a dog though I never considered owning one. I wasn't confident I could keep a pet alive for more than a few months, and likely it'd piss everywhere. She took a drink, then handed the bottle to me. I drank quickly. She flung her cigarette to the ground and stamped it with her boot. Done. She pointed to the left with one confident finger. I turned to see a dog rummaging through a trash bin two alleys over. You didn't do that. He was already there. I shook the bottle in her face, scotch flying. Prove it. The dog's head was still buried in the trash, paying us no mind. Call him. She snatched the bottle from my hands. I don't know his name. 
It's whatever you want it to be. She took a drink. I looked at the dog, thinking hard. Scotch, I hollered. The genie giggled. The dog jolted, his head knocking into the side of the bin. He turned to face us, a half-eaten Taco Bell chalupa, wrapper and all, wedged sideways in his mouth. Ears upright and at attention, he watched us. Then, as if he was recognizing old friends, his stance loosened. He trotted toward me, tail wagging. Well, fuck me. The dog found a comfortable spot at my feet. I knelt to pet him, the burrito still between his teeth. His hair was matted, and he smelled of mildew and refried beans. He panted heavily and happily, hot breath blowing in my face and drool pooling between us. I stood up and reached for the pack of cigarettes in my shirt pocket. The box was empty. Fuck, I need another cigarette. Here, the genie tapped my shoulder, a cigarette in her extended hand. I took it carefully, afraid of what might happen if my fingers touched hers. She sniffled just slightly and wiped her red nose with her jacket sleeve. That doesn't count as a wish, does it? Genies could be tricky. It could, but I won't count it. I sighed in relief. I turned back to the dog at my feet, but he was already gone. He was shuffling back toward the alley. He's leaving. Scotch, come back. Unfazed, the dog kept moving, turning the corner and out of sight. The genie shrugged and placed the bottle in my hand. Next wish. I took a drink and stared at my feet. I thought about Jessica, who worked three desks down from me. I knew her every detail. I pictured her at her desk, typing unabashedly as her acrylic nails collided with keys. She always had a spoon ring on her left thumb and a crescent moon-shaped earrings in her ears. She preferred two and a half creamers in her coffee. She took a smoke break at 10.15 and then another at 1.30. She smoked Marlboro Reds. I did too. I waited for the day she'd run out and ask me for one. Me, the man who left his pack of Marlboros on the corner of his desk, hoping she'd notice. We smoked the same cigarettes. Please talk to me. I wanted to love her more than anything. I want to fall in love. I sat on the pavement. I let both hands hang between my knees, eyes on the ground. I hoped that the genie couldn't feel the lonely rolling off of my shoulders like heat from an old radiator. The genie sat too. She placed her hand on my arm. She squeezed my arm so slightly I wasn't sure she'd done it at all. Her hands looked like Jessica's, slender with freckles, but no rings or polish. Clean, untouched hands. Before I could specify who I wanted to fall in love with, the genie tucked her hand under my chin and mashed her lips into mine. Our teeth clashed, mouths moving against each other in a way that was abrupt and unfamiliar. I couldn't tell if it was my mouth or hers that tasted like scotch. Then it was over. She looked at me, purple lipstick smeared across her cheek, and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. She licked her thumb and began wiping the lipstick from around my lips, her thumbs scraping along a three-day stubble. But I don't know you, the words stumbled out. But I know you. I believed her. What a, another great, great story. Jacob, you're, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, I was just going to say real quick, I, I'm posting in the chat the list of the Penman Review winners. If you get a chance, uh, you should read, look at Taylor's um, style on the page and stuff and how every single line is numbered. Um, I really thought that was a really cool practice that you did. And honestly, when I read this, when I was reading it um, during the judging contest and stuff, I thought what's really cool about this is that you could take any single one of these lines and they could be the first line to a short story or to, mm -hmm. to a novel. Like every single one of them carries such breadth to it and stuff that it's it's just a really cool uh, concept and everything. So is there a reason why you did it that way or? Um, yeah, so I um, many moons ago took a course in postmodernism, and um, I almost exclusively write flash fiction. So I've always been super fascinated by um, brevity and the short form. And that was exactly kind of what I was trying to do is I wanted to pinpoint the to me the most important important little details in this story and kind of give them the opportunity to stand out on their own. 
Um, I also really love the idea of playing with numbers since we kind of start the beginning at somebody getting pre-qualified for how many wishes they're allowed to receive. Um, so I really liked that idea as well. Um, and I had, I tried the story in a number of styles. Um, I, I tried a vignette style at one point and then nothing really seemed to kind of stick and, until we did it this way. So. Well, awesome. It, it definitely paid off and I, I really appreciate it. Um, just the way it's written and I, to be honest, I, everyone's stories tonight, there have been this one, there's a, some some great humor in it, of course. Um, it's still a bit sad, of course. Uh, and when you read the, I guess that's the title too. You think this could be, any of these numbers could be switched around and stuff because of the, just the situation of this particular narrator. But then all the other pieces that we read tonight too have such strong emotional connections and everything. So if everyone else who read tonight would like to come on camera and stuff, we can open it up for a Q&A. Um, and if anyone has any questions in the chat, uh, please feel free to post them. I'm going to hand it back over to Paul because I, Paul, I, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> I didn't know I was on mute. Um, but if you want to go ahead and get the ball rolling uh, with the questions and stuff, and then I'll keep an eye out on the chat. Sounds great. Um, okay. So, yeah, we, we have, uh, um, I'm running a little bit short on time, so I don't know that we'll get to all of the questions, um, unfortunately, but I have a question that I can kind of we can kind of do this around Robin a little bit. Um, and that question is this. Um, several of your bios mention the childhood roots of your inspiration to become writers. How important is it to you as adult writers to maintain a connection to your childhood self? And how do you nurture and protect that connection? And if you can just kind of, you know, take that one at a time, that would be great. Maybe Taylor, maybe you can start. Yeah, sure. Of course. Um, so I'm actually one of those people that I, I had no idea I wanted to be a writer and was not super interested in it as a kid either. Um, I've always been an avid reader. Um, so for me, a lot of who I really try to stay connected to is early writing Taylor, undergraduate Taylor. Um, I, I really try to stay true to kind of her ideas, um, what she was interested in, um, what she really wanted with her work and where she wanted her work to go. So um, I kind of I kind of res resonate a lot more with her. Um, but yeah, I didn't I had no idea I wanted to be a writer. I didn't figure it out until college. And then I was like, hey, I kind of like this. Dave, how about you? Um, I always wanted to be a writer. I didn't know I always wanted to be a writer, but um, I think I kind of did, and I didn't. I just kind of denied it, you know, until I was older, and I like I gotta write stuff. Um, but if you can see my cat's ears, by the way, <laughs> just <laughs> ignore her. Um, but I mean, in terms of trying to stay connected to my writing, a lot of what I write is not always but stuff that i try i would have liked to read when i was a kid um even like if it's like big fantasy adventures or even just like quieter stuff stuff that i'm always trying to chase that the feeling that made me want to write or made me finish a book and just sit there and like stare at a wall so that's kind of always my end goal i think yeah i see your your camera has has finally decided to work so yay welcome <laughs> Can, can you Welcome. can you take that question? Yeah. So when I was a really little kid, I had a really intense stutter. So my connection with writing and reading was that as a mean to like communicate with others. Um, and some of my favorite stuff to read were like Mother Goose news story rhymes and uh, fairy tales. So I like to kind of like capture the magic in the horror um, and just kind of remain like rooted in emotion as I'm writing, so I can like stay connected and communicate with others. And how about you, Ness? Ness, do you, do you want to take that question? Yeah, um, I wouldn't say that I knew that I was going to be a writer as a child, but I always kind of knew that I liked to tell stories. Uh, I would entertain, you know, my brothers in car rides with stories about like adventures that our cats were going on when we weren't home and you know things like that um and i i echo a lot of what gabe said about um writing stories that you would have enjoyed or needed uh when you were younger a lot of things that i write are inspired by 
kind of the holes that, you know, I wish had been filled. And uh, when I was a kid. That's, that's wonderful. I mean, there's something very generous, isn't there, about the act of writing from a source like that. You're trying to give, give somebody what you needed and, and didn't have. It's really, and I mean, I, I feel like, that generosity of spirit is present in your in your stories because they these are stories that give readers so much. Yes. Um, so we, we had had too many questions from the chat and stuff, but we are running short on time. So I think we could kind of do another round robin here of of just a general question as is you know what's next for all of you? What are you working on now? Um, where do you hope to go next? I know that eventually you all want to uh, be writers or have some uh, career in writing and stuff, but um, in the meantime, what's that next step before you get to there? Um, we can go back to Taylor on this one and then continue from there. My answer will probably be the weirdest one. Um, so right now I'm actually at SNHU pursuing a degree in business administration and human resource management. Um, the immediate future goal is just stability for me and my family. Um, in the long run, though, I would really love to hopefully uh, publish a collection of flash fiction and publish a collection of pro poetry. I almost exclusively write uh, flash and poetry, and I would really love to teach creative writing adjunct on the side and uh, raise my daughter and hopefully another another baby, maybe. So. Excellent. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, Ree, how, how about you? So my future plans, um, right now I have a couple stories that I have going on in the back burner, my thesis novel, and um, I have a couple like novellas or maybe like novelettes that I have ongoing right now that I'm working on as well. Um, I'm also working on trying to produce more art, book more um, events that are local to the Midwest areas just so I can promote my self-published works um, and just kind of continue working and trying to turn my uh, passion into writing into a full-time gig. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Um, thank you so much for sharing. And and Gabe, you you you. Um, yeah, I mean, next steps is I want to finish my degree in creative writing. Um, I came back to school after a long gap, and that's my first goal. I'm also working like I'm always working on a bunch of projects because I have that you know brain like jumping from one thing to another. Um, I recently finished a manuscript that I'm going to edit soon and maybe search for an agent. Um, and Beyond that, I have a couple, like, I think a short story coming out in an anthology. Um, but I don't write as much short fiction. So anything beyond that remains to be seen. Awesome. Well, congratulations on the anthology publication, too. That's good. That's great news. Um, Ness, how about yourself? Uh, right now, a lot of my energy is going into finishing school um, and establishing uh, my career. I'm currently interning at like a literary agency. So I don't have a lot of time to write right now. Um, but I do have a novella floating around and a few short stories that I'm hoping to finish up in the next few little bits here. It's funny how when you start working in the literary field, you suddenly have less time to write. <laughs> um, same with teaching, of course, creative writing and everything. But what I heard from all, all of you is uh, are very different pathways moving forward, but all you know, really meaningful ones and and ones that I see I'm like I'm very happy for all of you for pursuing all of those interests and stuff and and keeping keeping your um prospects broad and everything and, and and looking looking in a lot of different ways and stuff to continue to work on the craft. I think that's really important and and is a good message um for all of our guests tonight and stuff is that writing is not a one, two, three thing. You can do all kinds of things with it and, and pursue it in a variety of ways. So that's, um, is that we're at the nine o'clock mark, surprisingly. Um, just wonderful stories all around. I always love this word for word event. Uh, this year was no exception. You all did excellent work. Um, thank you to Taylor Castros, Gabe Converse, Ree Bunch, Ness Wheeler, and Mackenzie Bodley, who un unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, but uh, we wish her well uh, for sharing their work with us. Um, for more about their award-winning pieces, again, don't forget to check out thepenmanreview.com. There are other stories there as well. 
um, but be sure to read these and share them uh, with uh, your colleagues and friends and family and everything. And um, we will have this recorded and um, uploaded to our YouTube channel soon. And so keep an eye out for that and you feel free to share and distribute that as much as you'd like as well. Um, we're so glad you were able to join us this evening. Keep an eye out for future events at Word for Word. Um, the next one, the next one is actually our instructor spotlight. We have two instructors who will be reading for us. One is Carla Smith, um, who just won a, 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 a fifty, I think it was like a fifty thousand dollar grant from the Poetry Foundation um, for her poetry, and then uh, MFA instructor Stephanie uh, Whitevich. Um, it's going to actually be our first poetry themed event. Uh, we try to, uh, you know, have all of the concentrations represented here. Last year it was uh, nonfiction. This year it's going to be poetry. Um, so we're really excited for that. That'll be on Wednesday, February 20, 21st. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, you'll see announcements here and there and every which where. And um, again, thank you so much, everyone, for reading uh, for us tonight. Congratulations on your award winning stories. I wish you all the best uh, with your writing. Um, Paul, you have anything else to say? <laughs> uh, just to echo that, I, I, I feel uh, I feel really privileged to have been able to listen to you read your stories, and I, I predict the wonderful things for for all of you. You're an incredibly talented group of writers. Yes. Well, thank you, and thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your night, and thank you for coming in word for word. And take care, everyone. <laughs>